Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to the Watchbox and thanks for logging on. Today we're here with our first collector conversation since inaugurating the new brand and the new studio. Steve, welcome to the program. Thanks for inviting us, for inviting me and my watches. Um, but some of the watches that I'm fond of that I've collected over the years and we can tell a little story behind them. Yeah, definitely. We're going to walk through your history as a collector, some of your other passions, and I would be remiss not to acknowledge that we have your fine family in the room as our studio audience. So with that said, let's start with some wrist shots. What are you wearing today, Steve? Uh, I'm wearing a Breitling, and you know the model more yeah, than I Bre do. Breitling Blackbird. That is a 2012 edition of 2,000 pieces. That's a lovely watch, and I think Personally, with the Grand Date and the Chronograph, that's one of the best modern Breitlings. But it's not your only Breitling on the table tonight. No, my first Breitling was a uh, Breitling. I went to the Garberg store when they were originally on Walnut Street across from the location we're at now. And just saw this watch. I fell in love with it. My wife was at work who worked a few blocks away. And I called her and I said, you have to leave work and come meet me. I have something I need to show you. She walked in thinking I'm buying her something, and it was for me. Then it was really the first time I bought a collector watch, or a Breitling watch anyway, and I didn't realize that the price of the watch did not include the band at the time. Ah, okay. So Problems. I'm like going over my budget buying the watch, and then I'm like, I got to get the band too, it's separate, and I'm like, all right, we're going for it. My wife just saw the love that I had when I saw this, and my eyes sparkled it. I had to have it. And I can totally relate to that, if I may hand model it for our macro camera guys. Do you remember this size and proportion of Breitling cases? Wind rider, chronometer, beautifully made, and, and still in fantastic shape. I, I can see you've kind of worn this one easy. I'm not hard on my watches. If it, I'm doing something that's going to be rough, I have other watches that I'll call everyday watches that I would wear so that I keep my, what I call good watches in perfect shape because that's the way I am with everything that I do. My cars, my boat, I'm just, everything is, always has to be perfect. And we'll definitely get to those, but let's just start, I guess, by talking about how you came into the world of watches. When did you first get the bug? Do you have early memories of family, friends? Um, I think some friends would come in and talk about watches, and I was wearing stuff that wasn't like anything terrific, and people, associates I would meet through work, and um, I'm like, you know what, I'm going to get one of these watches and see what it's all about. And I did, and since then it was like, I got to have this and that, and I have to get from my wife and my daughter and everybody else and just have memories of them. Now, you mentioned a little bit earlier that you actually came into the world of, of Gothberg watches by means of a timepiece you bought for your wife, and that was sort of the inception of the whole passion. Yes, she always wanted, since we were married, she wanted a Beluga, which is made by Ebel. Ebel, an Ebel Beluga, and I was in Gothberg's and I saw the watch from the pictures that she had shown me and I'm like called her and I'm like they have the watch you want that you've been dying for and again I she came over and it was the watch and I'm like you're getting it and that was to keep her happy happy wife happy life yes and then then it allowed him to even the score and thus the wind rider so an absolute uh, perfect turnabout I would say that's fair play yes now your interest in watches has kind of seen you collect a little bit of everything over the years. You have some quartz, you have some automatics, you have some vintage, you have some contemporary. We have this whole array on the table. Maybe you could take us through some of the memories you have associated with these pieces. Well, this watch is actually, my father-in-law gave this to me, and it was, he's, him and my wife and my mother-in-law were from Argentina. May I act as your hand model? Sure, and the bracelet is, Handmade gold, cannot be duplicated. Um, it's an Omega watch that's inside of it, and it is just brings back memories of my father-in-law, who was a great person, and the love he had for this watch. And I wear it to special occasions, and I always feel a part of him with me when I do wear it. And and it is gorgeous. It's a beautiful 1950s Omega internally with, I believe you, you said the bracelet and the case were both crafted by the same artisan and in yes. rose gold. Yes, Hand, handmade in Argentina. In Argentina, they use a lot of rose gold. 
and impressively, both in rows and in fantastic shape, this, this watch does not look its age. It has the period charm, but not the wear and tear. Correct. He, he didn't wear it a lot, and I don't wear it a lot. It has his initials actually on the buckle, which you probably can't see, or maybe you can, but it's just a fabulous watch, and every time I wear it, I get nothing but compliments on it. Absolutely, and, and I love the, I actually love the triple bar adjustable buckle, because I, I have my own funny memory of that mechanism specifically. The first time I ever met Ariel Adams, I was trying to help him try on a, a watch, a vintage Patek Philippe Beta 21 at one of our events we did back in the Watch You Want days. And I was having a fitful time fitting the thing to his wrist. And he's like, come on, you're supposed to be the expert. I'm like, great, this is how we meet. Well, this way, if you go through a period of putting on a few pounds in the winter and taking them off in the summer, you can still wear the watch and it fits perfect. If you wonder what they did before Easy Link, guys, Rolex fans, take note. All right, so now you have a couple of other more contemporary watches. We talked a little bit about your first Breitling. We talked a little bit about the, the oldest entrant and the family heirloom in the collection. But if you could take me around, perhaps, about your Tag Indy 500 and talk about where this came from. Well, the Tag Indy 500, um, I wanted to get a watch for work that I enjoyed wearing and I knew what it was, but I didn't want, I'm in a, uh, car sales and I didn't want my customers to feel like I was wearing an expensive watch. So I bought this knowing that I knew what it was. It wasn't as expensive as a Breitling or some of the other watches that I have. I've been wearing it almost every day for years and years and years. I get it polished once in a while at Goldbergs. They have a, just give it to them, they polish it, they change the battery and it comes back looking brand new. And I just love this watch. It's got, it's heavy. It's got some stability oh, yeah, to FMA. it. Thank you. And the, it's just very comfortable to wear. It, it's substantial, and it, it actually fits the theme of, of your work. You are, you're in the auto industry, but right. you're also a collector and an enthusiast. And that's one of the reasons why I like this particular model of the tag is it had to do with with work with the racing part of it and everything. And I work for a Chevrolet dealer, and the Corvettes and Camaros are kind of racy and. That's, that's terrific. Now, I know autos have always been a passion of mine, and you said you've owned some I've had, incredible um, cars. Share in, with our in audience. The, in the 70s, I've had a Camaro, a Hemi Cuda, um, a, a 916 Porsche mid-engine, which was like their starter model, but I was in my early 20s when I had that, so it was a Targa roof, it was great. Um, and the Cuda was a convertible, the Hemi the, Cuda. Yes. That's the one that got away. Uh, yeah, that, well, you know, it's funny because I run into like people that I went to high school with that I haven't seen in 30 years or 35 years and they're like, I remember your white Camaro. You always drove around, you went through, uh, I, somebody bought a car from me last week that I went to high school with. He's like, I remember you always went through two or three sets of tires a year. You were the only person that could go through a set of tires in a summer. Because it's all I did was lay wheels and burn the oh, rubber sure. off of them. I would. Yes. Yeah, it was the way that we drove back then, not like you do now. Now, do you, do you collect um, or accumulate cars the same way you accumulate watches? I know as a collector, I tend to be very deliberate and road map my acquisitions. Are you more emotional or do you like plan these things long range? Um, car buying is definitely emotional. It's not like the kind of thing that you go in, or at least for me, it's not. Um, although the, the first Porsche that I had, the, the 916, I was going to keep forever until somebody went through a red light and totaled it. And um, it's funny, I live at 15th and Locust, and that accident happened at the corner of 15th and Locust, and when he hit me, my car went down the steps of the subway there. And when I came to, oh I'm looking up and had no idea where I was. But I was, um, I'm fine, I'm here to talk about it. And that just proves that the car is for now, the watch is forever, it takes looking and keeps on ticking. That is true. So if you could, I guess, tell me a little bit more, because this is one of the more unusual watches we have right here. It's, it's a Chariol, and it's got a fantastic, almost, almost Tag Heuer link-like bracelet on it. This is an unusual brand. It's, Where does this come from? It's a watch that my wife was looking for a watch since I was buying watches, and she fell in love with this watch, and we had it. She wanted something bigger because everybody was starting to wear bigger watches at the time. So that was the fad. So we got this watch for her. We took the links out. She wore it for about a year, a year and a half, and she stopped wearing it 
and I'm like, where's that Chariot? I love that watch. And she's like, oh, I'm tired of it. She got bored. So I took and put the links in it, and I wore it for about a year and a half. Then she's like, give me my watch back. So we took the links out of it, and she wore it. And I guess about six or eight months ago, she was not wearing it again. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to take it, and I'm going to wear it. And I wear that not every day, but I wear it a lot on weekends and knock around in it. And it just holds up great. It's very comfortable, like you said. Um, and it's different. People don't think of Chariel as like a, it's just, the, the detail of it I love. It, it is very substantial in the hand. I have to say, Chariol of Geneva, which has kind of like a, a mini Louis Vuitton thing going on. They make watches, they make handbags, they make some jewelry, they right. make some belts and leather goods. They built a very robust watch, and it's impressive that perhaps the heftiest watch on this table is the one you share with your wife. The biggest, the heaviest, the most substantial. So I guess here's a question then. I think we both agree that you're more of an emotional watch enthusiast. You, you see something you like and you go for it. What would be like your aspirational watch, your grail watch, your, oh my God, I got to have that someday? Um, I'm the kind of person that I'd much rather buy something for others than for me. So if I were to walk by or see a watch that I thought my wife would like more than myself, I would spend the money on her before I would spend it on myself. So it depends on if I saw something that I thought she would love. But then I would get a hold of her to make sure I didn't make the mistake. Okay, that's, that's a very diplomatic answer. I can see that his minder is glaring at him from across the room. <laughs> I'm, I'm always the one that I'd rather buy for others than buy for myself. Certainly, and, and that's, that's a great philosophy because I think, well, for A, it helps that they share watches within the family, so double win. A and B, I think that's, that's the best part of collecting watches, uh, the fraternity or the, the amity that you have with other people who enjoy them. And even better if it could be a wife or an immediate family member who shares that passion. So, selfishly speaking, what kind of watch do you admire? Like, once, once you've done the dutiful thing, what would you love to have? Um, the Patak is Patak a watch Philippe, that I've yeah. always loved. I don't know if I would pull the trigger on one right now, but um, that's a watch that I always loved, the, the craftsmanship of it and looking at the dials and the bands and everything of it. Um, Breitling, you can't go wrong with. I just love the whole line of Breitlings. Um, I think for between now and next summer, I would love to get the uh, a Breitling with the rubber band for to wear down the shore, um, to go swimming in and everything. I just can't even though I know these are waterproof, it, with the metal band, I just can't seem to go into a pool with it. I appreciate Where, that. With a always... rubber band, it's just more of a thing of going in the pool. Yeah, you don't have to worry about scratching against the edge. You don't have to worry about the quartz crystals in the sand when you're at the beach. And folks, we are local to Philadelphia, so the shore to which he refers is the semi-infamous Jersey Shore. Think only good things. For everything else, there's YouTube. But right, <laughs> and, and from here, living a block away from where we're, the studio here in the Godberg store, uh, in the wintertime, it's 40 minutes to get to the Jersey Shore, and in the summertime, it's anywhere from 40 minutes to an hour. And that puts a premium on versatile watches. Now, of course, here we have winters where it will snow and it will snow thick. And then at the same time, in the summer, we go to the shore. And all of your watches are fairly versatile. With the exception of the heirloom, every watch you have here is a fairly moderate size and stainless steel, which can wear to dinner, it can wear to the shore, it can wear to the club. You collect versatile pieces. Is, is it fair to say that you see them as part of a bigger lifestyle, cars, wine, yes, watches? Yes, I, um, I buy the watches to wear them, not to look at them, basically. Um, and I do take care of them with getting, you know, when if, if it's a battery watch like the TAG, um, I make sure that it's sealed because I'll spend the extra money and do it the right way and, and go to somebody that specializes in that, like such as Godberg. And I know it's going to be done right and they stand behind it. Um, there was a, the first, which watch was it that you bought, Sil? The, the Beluga was a, um, a collector likes to buy a watch that is automatic. My wife didn't know what automatic was, so we got an automatic Beluga and she didn't like the fact that she had to wind it. So she bought it back, unbeknownst to me, and was saying how she doesn't really like the watch and spoke to Mr. Godberg and 
they took the watch back and called her uh, the next day and said, I have one that has a battery in it. You'll be much happier with it, the exact watch, and there's no charge. And, you know, that, that makes you a customer for life when you have that kind of service. Yeah, Denny's always been uh, very on point about taking care of you after sales, and I think that's that's one of the great parts of us being now Goffberg and Watchbox. We handle both the after sales service of the watches we sell, whether you want to trade again, buy again, sell. There's the whole Watchbox side, and it's interlinked with Goffberg and all the people who have been the Goffberg brand forever. They continue over onto the Watchbox side. Right, and being in the automobile business. Um, and I'll give myself a plug, Go sales manager it. at Armand Chevrolet in Armour. Um, I know the service part of it, and we have customers just like I'm a customer, and I like to be treated the way that I would treat my customers. And when Danny did that, I'm a customer for life. And so it's also interesting that the watches are part of the, the lifestyle you were telling me about. You like going out to eat. You said your fridge is empty? Our fridge is empty. We eat out almost every meal. We just love grabbing a bottle of nice wine and walking down the street and say, there's a table for two, and we do it. I'm new in town, and our, our viewers, they're, they're from, obviously, the United States, but also around the world. For me and our out-of-state and overseas viewers. Could you give me some recommendations, places to eat in Philadelphia? Um, what well, is the scene? We like the Stephen Star restaurants are great, the um, uh, Budokan, depending on what kind of food you want, there's uh, the Continental Park for steak. We eat at the Palm a lot. We've been eating at the Palm since before they were in Philadelphia. My wife and I used to go with friends and drive to New York and eat at the Palm in New York and drive back. And now that they're in Philadelphia and they just redid it, we love it. Um, Paul, who's the manager, is great. And we eat at a lot of BYOBs. So Audrey Claire on 20th Street is one that you should try. Uh, across the street, 20 Manning is, is a, another one. There's just, Philadelphia has, I'll stack their restaurants up against anybody. You have Morimoto. We have great restaurants. Okay, so let's let's just play some uh, some word games. Fish or steak? In your um, opinion. Steak, but I tend to eat more fish for health reasons. White wine or red? Uh, Cabernets only. V vodka or bourbon? None at all. Ford or uh, no? Nah, never mind that one. <laughs> that that would be Chevy for sure. <laughs> you heard it here, guys. Um, well. Good taste in all things. Uh, I want to thank you so much, Steve, for coming thank on you. our show. Thank you. It's been great being here, and and actually, I learned about myself that I really enjoy my watches more than I thought I did. Well, that's a great thing. It watches are a journey that continues. It's about the machines. That's where it starts. But the people are the reason you stay. Come for the watches. Stay for the people. And folks, thanks for staying with us. I'm Tim. He's Steve. I'm Steve. This is Watchbox, and thanks for logging on. Thank you. My pleasure, Steve. Thank you.